Well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to SaltWorks Sabbath School class uh, on this uh, uh, crazy weekend. Uh, uh, who could imagine uh, being in a season like this? And then to boot, uh, I'm sitting here in Walla Walla, Washington, and it's snowing uh, on the ground, so it's just uh, surreal. Uh, it almost feels like we have this extended snow day that's going to last for days, weeks, months, who knows, uh, but uh, wild times. So, um, hey, we had hoped to have a whole bunch of us uh, uh, on the screen this morning, but uh, so some of the technology was um, uh, barking at us a little bit, so you're stuck with me in my uh, ball cap and earphones, and uh, uh, we'll see how this goes, and I'm hoping to uh, be able to get some dialogue going with your comments at the bottom of the uh, bottom of the page, which will be uh, a lot of fun. So if you haven't uh, participated yet in uh, SaltWorks, just uh, to let you know what we've been doing since January, our theme has been the kingdom of God and the politics of Jesus. And uh, our the, the intention was to start this new conversation uh, during this American political year. And I know that everyone uh, tuning in is not American, but uh, nonetheless, uh, here in the United States, we're in this wild political season with lots of acrimony and fighting. And so a group of us thought, what if we actually dove a little bit deeper into what it means to live the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, this great political project that God uh, launched in the person of Jesus, which uh, we've been talking about uh, since the beginning of January. If if it's not a major theme in the scriptures, um, it's the major theme. Like uh, there are literally hundreds of passages in the New Testament, thousands in the whole of scripture that are talking about the idea that sin entered the world. Uh, the globe is a mess, but because God wanted to change things, he had promised this Messiah, which is a political term. Uh, that there would be this new government that would come and uh, create a new reality. And so uh, we've been talking about that. Uh, the Messiah, uh, what does the kingdom of heaven mean? What does it mean for us to live in this world while we are citizens of a whole different reality? And so that's been our exploration as we've tried to think about, is it possible that we could transcend uh, this partisan divide between uh, Democrats and Republicans and all the cat and dog fighting that goes on and think a little bit more deeply and in a more transcendent way. So we've just had a marvelous time. If you haven't been a part of our class, just wanted to give you some background of what we've been up to. And we keep pushing it right to the edge, uh, getting as courageous as we can, uh, knowing that the class is filled with people from a, a variety of political perspectives, but also leaning into the idea that we have much higher loyalties and our uh, commitments to the kingdom uh, that Jesus is establishing on the earth. So where do we go today? Um, uh, we've kind of been pushing further and further into how we ought to be involved in our world politically, uh, making a difference in a better society. But um, it seems a little off just to continue to do that and not at least to pause for a second and think about what are the implications of living the kingdom in a time like this, which uh, could any of us uh, have drawn this up on a piece of paper and and tried to start to think about what does it even mean to, to live well the kingdom during this time? But uh, I think that the passage, probably the kingdom language that might come closest to Jesus having a vision uh, uh, a thought about how we might live as kingdom people during a season like this one that's filled with so much uncertainty and worry um, about the economy, about our physical health, about just the safety of the world for, for many reasons. It's got to be Matthew 6. And uh, if you have a, a Bible near you or uh, a couple of devices in hand, uh, you know that right there buried in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus addresses uh, human beings directly uh, on this issue. And uh, the subject, you'll remember, is worry. 
uh, human beings worry a lot, Jesus says. And uh, Jesus cuts right to the issue about many of the reasons that we worry and that we're full of stress. And uh, he starts to name some of these things, you know, whether or not you're going to have food to eat. Now, that's really interesting, giving all of the hoarding that's gone on at the grocery stores. Even this morning, I was looking at pictures of entire aisles of things gone. Uh, not only uh, toilet paper, but uh, food of different kinds, uh, baby formula, all kinds of um, products in the grocery stores just completely gone. You know, runs at Costco and Walmart and uh, just desperation. So Jesus comes in and says, uh, worry about what you eat. Or we might say, uh, worry about your groceries or your supplies. And, and he, he offers sort of this bold take. He says, why do you worry about all of that? Uh, which is a pretty courageous thing. So then, and then it goes on, of course, what you will eat, uh, what you will drink, what, what will you wear? Um, and then he kind of describes the panic over these things. He says the, pe the pagans uh, worry about these things. Um, and I don't think he's trying to diss uh, people who are not Christians or believers. I don't think this is kind of throwing the rest of humanity under the bus, but certainly is laying out and saying this way of thinking is not healthy, this desperation that causes you so much stress. And then he says um, the remedy uh, to kind of stepping away from all of those obsessions is uh, to think about how God cares for the, the flowers of the field the birds of the air, uh, which, by the way, uh, we read those passages and we think, yes, God does care so much for the flowers of the field, but the flowers are fragile, actually, and they get trampled on and they get killed. So that's interesting. I think it's, well, don't worry. You know, the flowers don't worry uh, and God cares for them. Well, also, they get destroyed pretty easily. And the same with the birds of the air. You know, the birds aren't stressed, Jesus says. So don't stress uh, about the birds. Well, uh, I don't know about you, but we have these big plate glass sort of windows at the back of our house. And during certain times of the year, the birds are like flying into these windows and killing themselves. And the cats next door catch birds. And uh, one of our dogs we found with a whole baby bird in its mouth a few months ago. I mean, to be a bird is not to be in a particularly secure position. So it's interesting that Jesus uses these metaphors uh, or examples of don't worry, be like flowers, don't worry, be like birds, and picks these two things that by their very nature are, are fragile. They're susceptible to injury uh, and disease. So that's interesting. So Jesus goes from uh, don't worry about these things, what you'll eat, what you'll drink, uh, what you're going to buy, your personal security, be like these other things in nature that you look at, which are fragile by nature. And instead, he then offers kind of this powerful verse. And uh, my, my uh, colleague, Japheth, I don't know if you're posting some of these ideas, but there's this incredible verse, seek first the kingdom of heaven uh, and the righteousness of God, and all these things will be added to you. Now, this is a curious uh, phrase. Uh, Seek first the kingdom of God uh, and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added. And so I have a, a dial on there. Like if you think about all of the, uh, the dials of your life, all the dashboards, uh, all the metrics that you're trying to keep in line. So think about that, right? You've got uh, health measures and you're worried about your kids. And so you've got a bunch of uh, measures for them. Uh, you've got uh, your home life, your finances, your uh, what used to be your retirement account, which is completely gone at this point. Um, and by the way, if you're 30 years old and you're laughing at that, it's easy if you're 30 and you're laughing at that. If you're, if you're 75, it's not quite as funny. Uh, but you have all the measures of your life, right? So all these uh, ways that you're sort of judging, am I secure or not? Is my are my children secure? Is my job secure? Uh, so that, that's a kind of a map on the screen there of, 
some of the things that I worry about, right? My wife and kids and uh, church responsibilities and my job. And uh, so you start to add up this, this wide complexity of all these things you're worried about. And Jesus sort of comes back with this one core metric and, and says, seek first the kingdom. So there's the political language. Seek first the politics of Jesus and, and his righteousness, his right way of thinking. And all these things will be added. Now, the curious thing uh, for me is I think that I've heard more than one preacher sort of give a prosperity gospel take on this. So if you if you have allegiance for God first, if you if you're righteous, if you do do what the church tells you to do, uh, if you are faithful to God, then all these other things, the food and the drink and the wealth and the medicine and all that toilet paper you're hoarding, that, it, that if you just trust God, all these other things will sort of settle out. But I, I think that that's a misread of this verse, and it certainly is in the context of all of the other Christian expectations that you find uh, in the New Testament, for example. So um, let me give you an example. So we go to the book of Acts, and you remember this story. Uh, Herod is uh, quite pleased with himself politically because he takes James and has James' head taken off, right? So James is dead. He's, he's decapitated. And uh, everybody's pretty excited about this that, you know, is on the side of Herod. And Herod is so um, sort of enthusiastic about this politically, about what it's doing for him, these actions, that then he puts Peter in prison. And you, you may know the story. Peter's in prison. The next day he's going to appear before a court. No doubt the same fate is going to, you know, happen to him. So he's going to have his head cut off. Well, there's this miracle, if you will, this earthquake takes place and um, uh, the, the angels come, the light shines, uh, Peter escapes. And we love to tell that story. In fact, we tell our children the story about how all these people are praying and Peter, um, actually, it wasn't an earthquake, was it? That was, that was Paul and Silas later. Uh, but there's this miraculous escape from prison. And we love to tell our kids this story about how if you pray, God will do these amazing things. And we love to tell the Peter story, but we don't, but we don't, we kind of pass over the James story. Um, and it didn't turn out quite so rosy for James in the moment. So I think that when Jesus says, um, and, and that's just one of many examples where in the New Testament, there's never a sense that if we follow God, calamity will not strike us. That's just not an expectation. I mean, Paul uh, writes multiple times about how he anticipates difficult times. Uh, he writes to Christians, you should expect that you're going to bear a cross and that times are going to be hard. So I don't think coming back to the Matthew uh, passage, sort of our core verse, I don't think that, that Jesus means it all. Seek first follow the way of the kingdom, and then all these other things that you want are just going to magically happen. They're going to be added to you. I think it's different. I, I think that Jesus is driving at something quite different. I suspect what he's saying is that if you will just commit yourself sort of to that one core dial, just completely leaning into that one driving expectation of life to, to, to trust God to follow his righteousness, to be invested in the kingdom, that if you do that, everything else gets sorted out. And I think that's different. It's not that all these things are going to be added and that suddenly you're going to become wealthy and your life's uh, comfortable and, and everything will be just um, perfect. I think it's that all the other things start to become clear to you. Uh, they may not be all that great. You might be the flower that gets trampled or the bird that runs into the glass or gets chased down by the cat. But you start to interpret all those things differently. 
and you start to live differently. And, um, and then you start to see these additions in your life where things become clear. So, um, so first Jesus says, seek that first and that will deal with worry and you will start to live in a different a reality completely. So, so what does that look like? Uh, practically, um, you may think, you know, maybe we think that this isn't a real storm right now. Maybe the media is hyped this or the country's overreacting, or maybe you're on the side. And I guess I'm kind of trust the scientists, uh, at the CDC who say, no, this is serious business. We're not giving this advice, um, uh, casually. We think that there's a threat here that needs to be dealt with. Uh, but nonetheless, whether wherever you come down on this, whether you think it's con contrived or whether you're in the camp that thinks it's awfully serious or some combination, we're in a bit of a situation now, uh, economically, politically, uh, just uh, the, the whole way of living. How do we live differently? I think this is the this is this becomes the question for our for our class uh, today. What, what does it mean if I'm going to take seriously Jesus and the kingdom? How would that impact how I looked at the next few days or weeks or who knows how long or, or many months? And what if the current circumstance spiraled and became worse with maybe even we taste anarchy or martial law? I'm not trying to hype it up. I'm just playing the set. Like, what, is it, what does it mean for us to live the kingdom, this other reality, if the kingdom of the world is, um, is falling apart? So um, I'm going to see if I'm getting any of your... Uh, uh, let's see if I'm getting any of your comments here. I'm having some... Uh, my, my good friends will tell you that having technical difficulties associated with me is not really a surprise. So... Um, I have a, I have an interesting relationship with that, with technology. So, uh, let me give you a couple thoughts about this. What, what does it mean for us to live differently? Uh, there's a man by the name of Tom Armstrong. You may or may not know, uh, Tom Armstrong and Tom Armstrong is an executive at LL Bean. Okay. The great outdoor company in Maine. It's like a $1.3 billion, billion dollar company. So he's a senior executive there, and he's also this great outdoorsman. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, there's a photograph of him, and he's pictured with three of his buddies. And get this, uh, in 2017, they completed a journey that took them over three decades. Now think about that for a second. It took them over 30 years as a group. To, to do this outdoor accomplishment. And uh, what they set out to do, which they achieved, is to circumnavigate New England. So they went, you know, the Atlantic Ocean and through the interior waterways up through Vermont, but they, they paddled their kayaks over 3,200 miles. And they didn't cheat. So uh, when I was researching this, they didn't like um, portage their kayaks. They didn't you know, sort of take ferries at certain points or overland routes. They actually, in a continuous way, went 3,200 miles uh, on this journey. And they every time they could take off work or they carved out some time, they would take the next little leg. So this guy's high-level executive, super motivated, absolutely committed to finishing the task, 3,200-mile kayaking journey around New England. Okay, so here's the story. Many, many years ago, he is on one of these great adventures, and he and some of his colleagues have planned uh, to hike Mount Logan, which is the second highest peak in North America. Okay, Mount Logan, 20,000 feet, second highest peak after McKinley in North America. It's in the Yukon Territory in Canada way up north it's just i think it's about 400 miles just outside of the arctic circle uh it's considered to be the largest mountain in the world even though it's not the tallest you can see it on a clear day i think it's from 250 miles 
this incredible mountain. And uh, the weather's uh, notoriously bad. So huge storms, wind, uh, frigid temperatures. It's just a serious read about. And that's about all I'll do, right? I, I'll read about it. So uh, he's up there. Um, they plan for months. So you can uh, imagine the intricacy of this sort of planning. Months and months and months of planning. And then the actual hiking is 21 days. So it's a serious climb for three weeks. So they go through all of these months, all of these weeks. They're up at 19,000 feet. Okay, they're within um, just a few hundred feet of their goal. They're within about six hours of their goal. When uh, one member of their team, and his name is Donnie, uh, starts to get cerebral edema. Now, you medical types will know what that is just by the terminology. You outdoor types might be familiar with it. So cerebral edema is when you get fluid in the brain, and it's a result of being at altitude. It's minus 27 degrees. They've got one of their colleagues that has a serious health condition. And uh, so they got to figure out what they're going to do. Uh, they try to call a helicopter, kind of radio uh, one in, uh, but the, the winds are too high, the weather's bad, so there's going to be no rescue. They do uh, notice, they're aware that there's a Canadian team that has summited, they've already achieved the goal and they're on their way down. And the Canadians say to them, hey, we're happy to take your colleague down to safety. Uh, so the rest of you can achieve your goal. So what happens next is fascinating. Uh, apparently the team gathers and Tom is the team leader and they have a discussion about what, what they're gonna do. And there's actually an argument that they have disagreement about what their next play will be. And some say, yeah, let's send our, let's send Donnie down with these Canadians. And um, others, including Tom, say, no, we've got to uh, keep him with us. And what Tom, uh, his argument is uh, the golden rule, which is interesting. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And, and Tom, first of all, thinks, if I were in this condition, kind of like losing my mental abilities, I'm super sick, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm in trouble. Would I want my team to send me off with a group of people I didn't know? So, so this goes through his head. Second, Tom is concerned that he's putting extra pressure on the Canadian team because the descent is no picnic either, right? This is serious business. It's treacherous. And uh, he realized it, it's going to up their level of challenge. So it's kind of pushing uh, an extra problem on their team. And then he just thinks about what really matters in life. And he reflects on this years later about what does moral courage look like? And he comes to the conclusion, um, and everybody's not happy, by the way, on his team, uh, but he's the chief. Uh, he, he's in charge of the group, and he says, no, months of planning, 21 days of hiking, six hours from a significant accomplishment, and he says, no, we're going down, and he tethers Donnie to him. He has to uh, rope him, uh, rope them together, which, again, putting himself in a lot of personal peril as they're going over cliffs and... Um, and, and they keep Donnie, and they take him all the way back down to safety. And he's asked later uh, in this article I read, do you have regrets? You know, all these years later, do you regret that you never were able to accomplish that goal? And, and he says no. And he goes on to talk about why he doesn't regret this. And, and in so many words, and I'll, I'll kind of put it, it with my paraphrase, he says, there are higher summits. It's interesting, right? He says there, there are higher summits in life than getting to the top of Mount Logan. And the higher summit is how you treat people. 
the the greater climb is how you care for someone when they're sick even though you're not sick by the way that's interesting in the times we're living in i could say hey i'm i'm relatively young why do i you know why do i have to be careful with all the things that are going on uh, well maybe i'm maybe i'm uh, sort of uh, putting aside some of my goals some of the summits i would really like to climb because there's some other people that are at risk and so i set those things aside in order to come back down the hill to make sure that they're well cared for um i've even engaged in some of this dialogue uh you know well why you know people die with the flu it's just a, a part of life but uh, i don't know what if what if we were saving ten thousand lives thirty thousand lives uh because of these precautions uh, i mean is it worth it because the stock market didn't hit a new peak or we didn't get to go where we wanted to go on our, our, our spring break or uh, it at least raises the possibility, you know, we can have a, uh, if we were all in the same room, we could, you know, really have a rigorous conversation about this, but it at least raises the possibility. And I think this is what Tom's example does that uh, we need to, um, to think about higher peaks that maybe there's things more significant than uh, the stock market, than um, our own economic prowess, than our, our vacations. Maybe, maybe we need to reassign where our mountaintops are in life. And maybe that would be a good project even for reflection this afternoon or in these next few days when we are sort of homebound. Uh, is it, is it, um, do we really know where our highest peaks are? What are the things that really matter? What are we giving our lives to? Uh, what are we trying to climb? What are we planning for? What What are we risking? Uh, does it tend to be uh, Does it tend to be things that only we um, will only benefit ourselves, uh, or, or are we living for others? So I I just I don't know. I think that when you when you look at what Jesus says seek don't don't worry about all these other mountains to use the metaphor uh, they cause lots of worry and lots of stress change your goals to seek first the kingdom and his right and in, in, in god's righteousness and everything else starts to starts to settle out it starts to make sense and it may mean that some of your goals right like um climbing mount logan never happen uh, working to follow Jesus might mean that you say goodbye to some of those some of those goals, uh, but then maybe it opens up a possibility for others, and maybe it is, you know, the 3,200 miles that Tom and his uh, buddies uh, kayaked around New England. It's not that there aren't other goals, but it may mean that you are trading some for others because you want to value uh, uh, other things. Uh, so maybe that's a lesson. Maybe that's something that this crazy time that we're living in teaches us. Whether you think this is a legit uh, crisis or you don't, or wherever you come down in the conversation, it at least is a time to recalibrate and say what really matters here, um, and 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 what's higher. I mean, I if if I can quote my friend uh, Tim Gillespie, uh, the the lead pastor at Crosswalk. He often pushes us in, in kind of our private theological conversations about what's more aspirational, what, what's more elevated. How do we go to a higher place? Instead of just arguing about this or that, how do we constantly push ourselves to things that, that matter more, to first things, uh, which is what Jesus, um, uh, which is pr precisely, I think, what Jesus is talking about. Um, let me give you another example. Another, another story I read recently that's interesting. Uh, it was interesting to me anyway. So the woman's name is Valerie. Don't know her last name. Uh, but Valerie is a, um, a, successful, uh, a successful, relatively young woman who leads a small team of people, lawyers, accountants, and they have one account, okay? And the account they have is with a multi, a very wealthy multi-generational family. So this is interesting. 
So they're managing this family's wealth, right? So she's 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 doing a very good job. She has a good relationship with this family. She's very successful in managing this multi-generational, very wealthy family, their portfolio, and uh, has been loyal to them. They've been loyal to her for, for a number of years. When all of a sudden, this big time headhunting operation comes to her and says, we've got a proposal. We've noticed your work. Come work for us. And they offer her an astounding amount of money. In fact, it's multiple times, multiple times what she's currently making. And she says, no, I'm happy. They come back with a higher offer. Back and forth they go. And finally, they put a number on a page that, that gets her attention in a way that she just can't look away. So it comes down to signing. Okay. And uh, she sits down and learns that she has to, to take the job immediately. And she says, wait a minute, I, I'm willing to do this, but I can't take the job immediately because the arrangement I have with my current employer is that I have to give them six months notice. And the only way that I can break that pledge of six months notice is two things. One, if I let them know that I am personally dissatisfied with my current job. So they said, hey, if you're unhappy, we'll let you go. So I either have to tell them, yes, I'm unhappy, or that I have personally pursued a job uh, for my own career advancement, that I'm the one that's taken the initiative, that somebody's not come after me. But if I say to them, I need this for my career advancement, I went out and sought this, if one of those two things applies, then I can waive the six months. Okay. So let me say that again, just so we, we're, we're clear. So the contract is give us six months warning, unless you're really unhappy or unless you go out and find something that's really good for your career. So she tells this to this new company that's coming in with all these, th these big money offers. And they say, all right, that's no problem. Give us a couple hours. They come back. They have written a letter. Uh, for her to the family that basically stipulates that she is uh, unhappy with the job and that she is the one who's gone out uh, to pursue something new. And all they, uh, all that she has to do is sign it, right? So this new company comes in, all she has to do is put her signature at the bottom uh, of the page. And uh, she looks at that and she says, well, I can't, I can't sign this. That's not true. And they said, well, uh, the CEO is involved at this point. He says, uh, well, I'll give you a million reasons in addition to your signing bonus. I'll give you a million dollars if you put, put uh, the signature down on this page. Right there on the spot. Uh, and she walks away and she's like, I, I, I got to think about this. So she... Um, uh, goes back and she's just I she thinks I I can't do this how how even though I could go back to the family and probably talk to them about uh, some of these things um, and they probably would understand how can I go work for a company that has this level of uh, dishonesty and sort of low ethical values and so she she uh, walks away tells them she just can't you know she can't be a part of a, a, of a company with all this money that are, that will compromise her ethics. Um, and it's almost like she says, I can't get these golden cataracts. You know what I'm saying? That the, the, the money starts to blur my vision. If I start to go down this road, she says, I will, I'll begin to make decisions that are just not in line with my values. And I'll, and I'll probably be like the Enrons of the world. Um, and you remember, some of you will remember the company Enron, uh, probably nearly, I imagine nearly 20 years ago now, uh, loads of trouble because there was so much money happening and the board was being loaded up with so much money that there was no accountability. And basically, basically it was a mess. Um, and she said, no, I got to walk away. Again, Jesus says, don't worry about chasing after all of these things, all of the stress there's a different mountain that's a higher mountain. And I think that, that, again, here's another example. I think that's what what the story about Valerie, 
uh, illustrates powerfully of saying, I, I, I've got to be about, I, I have to be about ethical and moral commitments that are at a higher level. I can't just be about uh, outcomes along the way. Um, I think this is, I, I think this is, um, this is key. And even the Sabbath school class that we've been, that we've had, that we've been uh, talking uh, with one another now for nearly three months, I think this begins to inform our politics. Okay. So uh, I was going to start to uh, push us a little bit uh, in the class to consider some of these questions, but um, what do we vote for? Uh, what are, what, what are the, what are the, the, the top two or three things that cause us to want to vote or to advocate for certain things? Is it um, what, what's best for the economy or what's best for my wallet or, uh, or what is it? What are we, what, what, what are we pushing forward uh, as, as, as the things that are most critical? Are we voting for honesty, uh, integrity? Are we, um, are, are we wanting uh, to, to, to sort of uh, give ourselves to a politics uh, 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 that's elevated in some way again? Uh, what, are we, what are we looking for um, when we think about our political involvement? And um, see, I think these questions cross whether you're a liberal or a conservative, wherever you sit on the political sp uh, spectrum. Um, I've lived long enough to know that most of us, if we're not careful, are willing to sort of have uh, golden political cataracts and sort of turn a blind eye, if you will, towards uh, things that aren't so good because we know that um, it'll impact our wallet in some way or that it'll, it'll benefit, us, benefit us personally in some way. So I think it, I think it should push all of us uh, to say, if I'm gonna follow the kingdom of heaven, if I'm going to uh, be committed to uh, the righteousness uh, that Jesus teaches, that's the politics of Jesus, uh, how does this sort of reorder things uh, in my life? And I think, um, I think this is a pretty big deal. Okay, third example, uh, third story. And uh, for those of you who uh, were at the One Project uh, a few weeks ago, you're going to know this story. So I love history. And uh, I love presidential history. So I'm going to tell you a story about a Republican politician that I find fascinating by the name of James Garfield. Now, James Garfield, uh, you may think, ah, oh, was he a president or not? Or I think I remember that he that he was president. Well, he's actually 20th president of the United States. Okay, He was elected in 1880, but we don't know much about him because he was shot and then killed from some really horrible health care, which is a fascinating story. Uh, if, if you want to read a great book, by the way, uh, Candace Millard's book, um, uh, the historian Candace Millard, she has a fascinating book about this. But basically, he's shot, and then he gets uh, terrible health care, and he dies. So we don't know very much about him. Um, you know, if you if you take American history in fifth grade or in high school, Garfield sort of doesn't show up on the top 20 presidents that you know anything about. Anyway, he is the 20th president. He was elected in 1880. Go back a few decades. So this is before the Civil War. Uh, his father takes him to a religious revival. And James gives his life to Jesus. He uh, becomes a Christian. And he's inspired by these moral um, constraints, if I can use that term, these moral obligations, this this beautiful challenge of, of how to live an ethical life in the way of Jesus. And he actually becomes a preacher. So, th so the hero of the story is going to be a preacher, which is really cool for those of you that are preachers like me. Um, and uh, he's a very mild-mannered person, okay? Uh, high integrity, just a great personality. But there's one issue that absolutely has, has him wound up. He is an absolute militant on this, this issue, and the issue is slavery. So this is before the Civil War. And he becomes an abolitionist, uh, which you will know, an abolitionist is one of a very small minority of people. Always were very small, even in the North, um, never very popular, 
even among those that sympathize with their cause, but he becomes the most in the most radical political uh, party, if you will, or the most radical political position on the issue of slavery, that it had to end immediately. Um, in fact, when John Brown, who committed a lot of crazy sort of terrorist acts against slavery, on the day that John Brown was um, hung, the um, uh, 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 James Garfield uh, wrote in his diary, uh, slavery be damned. Like he, I mean, this was a big, even though he didn't agree with everything that John Brown was up to, he was really upset about this. So strong moral uh, outrage uh, about slavery, okay? About this, about the nature of politics and how it was hurting this group of people. So after the Civil War, uh, the slaves are freed, but, uh, but then what? So Garfield becomes an advocate for uh, suffrage or the right to vote uh, for uh, black men. Uh, he also pushes legislation in Congress that says it should not be illegal for a black person to walk the streets of Washington, D.C. without having to carry papers. So think about that. This is after the Civil War. If you were a person of color, you had to have papers proving that you had a legitimate reason to be in the nation's capital. And Garfield, again, just with this sense of moral um, umbrage, pushed against um, uh, pushed against this law and um, and uh, uh, made uh, made it possible for blacks to walk freely in in Washington D.C. And then he um, and, and then uh, he ends up. Uh, being the nominee, the Republican nominee for president in 1880. And what's fascinating is he doesn't want the job. He keeps saying no, he keeps being pressured. He, he absolutely doesn't want it, but they, his party pushes him to it and he feels finally this obligation. Well, he campaigns in the same way that Abraham Lincoln campaigned, which is to, which is to say he didn't campaign. Uh, he chose not to go out um, and, uh, publicly campaign because it was viewed that somehow it was arrogant to go brag about yourself. I mean, I can only, can we not only dream about a presidential campaign where the candidates can't say anything for the whole campaign? That would be an absolutely, absolutely beautiful thing. And so other people would advocate. Now, it is true that people would gather at his house uh, and they would show up there um, and he would give speeches and interact with folks. So this is the fall of 1880 towards the end of the campaign. This huge crowd gathers, and uh, historians note that it is populated not only with white people, but with black people as well. Um, and uh, people of color just, they love Garfield. They have this deep, affectionate relationship with him because he has been, for decades, on the cutting edge of caring about them. So big crowd is gathered. It's an emotionally uh, charged event. Uh, this young uh, college-aged black choir stands to sing. And apparently, uh, uh, there's not a dry eye in the crowd. People are just weeping in this, as this group of young people is singing. They're, they're bonded to Garfield and what he stood for, and it's just this incredibly beautiful scene. So when, um, when they're finished singing, Garfield stands up. And before he addresses the crowd... Uh, he turns back to the choir, and uh, Japheth, I think we have this. Uh, uh, he says this. So take a look at this quote. He says, I tell you now, in the closing days of this campaign, that I would rather be with you and defeated than against you and victorious. Wow. So what is what is Garfield what is Garfield modeling for us here? Uh, he says it and he means it. If you read about the trajectory of his life, he says, "I would rather lose the presidency and be a person of character, particularly on the matter of uh, caring for those who are being lost in society. I would rather not have political power in the kingdoms of this world." And be loyal to the values of the kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus, to which he had stood for, 
you know, 40 years since his conversion. Um, I think that's just incredibly powerful. Uh, it is at least for me when I read about this account. So uh, here you here you have this man who who has his priorities right, okay? And and I think I, again I just come back to to Matthew chapter six. You're, we're in a time of, of crisis. The the world is in tumult. People are worried and stressed, and they're worried because people are worried, and everything's a mess. And probably this political year was going to be a mess anyway without this. And Jesus says to those of us that follow him, step back for a second. Hang on for a second. Um, make sure that the mountains you're climbing are the right ones. Okay? So uh, for Tom, uh, it's that mountain peak's not as important as my friend. Uh, friends, relationships, and particularly people who are sick have to be the higher mountain. For Valerie, she says, look, money can't be the highest uh, mountain to climb. It's got to be the loyalty and the integrity that I have, not only to this family I've been serving, but integrity to myself. That I'm not going to lie. That I that, that my uh, core convictions are not going to be compromised along the way. Uh, I have a high. I have a higher mountain. And then for Garfield, and this is where it hits us, particularly those of us that are those of you that are listening in. That you, you know that we've been a part of the Sabbath school class together. It's got to mean that however we relate, and we'll have some fascinating conversations in the in the Sabbaths to come when we gather back together. But it's got to mean. Whatever our politics, whether you're predisposed uh, towards liberal politics or conservative politics or somewhere in the middle, whatever it means, it's got to start from a position that says, I've got to value the least of these in the world. I've, I've got to care for those who are enslaved. I've got to uh, side with those who are still being slighted. Uh, the, the famous words of Jesus when John the Baptist is questioning, is this the legitimate kingdom? I'm sitting here in prison on death row. Is this, is this the kingdom? And Jesus says, this is how you know. Tell, go tell John, the blind see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, uh, the lepers are cleansed, the good news is preached to the poor. Uh, this is how you know the, the kingdom is real, Right. Now, this is the, the, the this is the political platform of Jesus, uh, integrity, caring for people, particularly those who are suffering. That has to be the starting point, I think. And we can have debates and arguments. This would be my take. I mean, I think that we should have rigorous uh, conversations about how it is that we solve these problems. And sometimes there's liberal solutions, and sometimes there's conservative solutions, and sometimes I think there's approaches that come from. The federal government and states and the private sector and uh, nonprofits and we can certainly have a a good conversation about how all of that should take place. But um, it's got to start with first things. I mean, am I wrong about that? I, I mean, I feel like as Christians, as followers of Jesus, it has to start. We have to know what our first things are, and what are those virtues and values. Um, that Jesus teaches then, yeah, uh, perfect timing, Japheth. Uh, then when we look at all those dials and gauges of our lives, okay, and we say, okay, how do I sort out the complexity of personal life, work life, my academic life, all the decisions I have to make, I look through the word first. I look through the life of Jesus first. And that sort of gives me the, the spectacles I need uh, to look through and to see with clarity through those Jesus glasses. Um, and once again, maybe that's uh, the way forward. Maybe maybe that's uh, the project for us during these days when we're being quarantined, uh, that we do some serious thinking about what mountains we're going to climb, for sure. So, my friends... Um, if we're still in this fix next week, we're going to uh, see if we can solve some of these technological uh, challenges because I'd love to get more faces on this screen. And um, I, would love, um, I would love to see you next week. 
Uh, I would love to not have a monologue for 55 minutes because, and I'm sure you would like not to hear me for 55 minutes too. But uh, I, I just think it would be a powerful thing if we continue to have conversations uh, online and together, even if we're physically absent for a time. Uh, uh, send a shout out on social media, please, to Jafet Oliveira, who has been uh, uh, backing us up on all this. This has sort of been a joint project between the Saltworks um, uh, Sabbath School and, and the One Project. Also, thanks to Tim Gillespie and Crosswalk Church, another one of our collaborators. And by the way, they've got some beautiful worship, worship online today, as does the Walla Walla University Church. But anyway, I want to thank all of you so much. Uh, uh, and uh, if you've been able to listen and uh, uh, maybe your thoughts have been stirred a little bit, I want to thank uh, most of all Jesus for giving us serious things to think about. So hope you have a good Sabbath. Stay healthy, stay well, and I uh, look forward to seeing you uh, next week, if not before. Take care.